enjoying yourselves? Yes. Full of whiskey? <laughs> Dingle whiskey, I hope. We brought our own out. Before we start, I just have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, most of you who listen to the podcast will know Niall Donald. He's like my sidekick. He's on quite a bit. And... But I have to just... I have to keep him in check every now and then, right? So... This just happened uh, the other day. He's looking at me now going, what the hell is she on about? So we were doing this podcast on the Hutch tapes. And of course, there was a lot of bad language in it, right? There was effing and there was C word and there was this, that and the other. And uh, <laughs> this girl, Joanne O'Mara, puts up on Twitter, I love when Niall Oliver, being him, swears. And what does he answer? What does he answer? <laughs> Hopefully my mum doesn't listen. <laughs> so I told him we'd have to d discuss this. This is just not cool. And I thought this was a private enough forum to do that. Well, you know, like psychic, Nicola, in, you know, I am theoretically <laughs> your boss. So you do know that, like, you know. <laughs> Even I don't believe that most of the time, but in theory, in theory, I am Peter, boss. take that whiskey off him, please. <laughs> so we're not here for that kind of talk. We're here for much more serious business and uh, Emma was great. We were snuck down the back listening to her. I loved her bit about being a crime journalist and going, you did what? <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about the gangsters that inspired the movies because we're here for the, the Dingle Whiskey Movie Club and we've been watching all these pretty cool films and uh, behind them are actually real life characters, most of them. Um, you know, they're sort of iconic movies, but there are real life people there, most of them in the past, but there's parallels with a lot of the guys that we talk about as well. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through with our notes, because there's a lot to talk about here, um, some of the movies and some of the characters that inspired them. And first up, of course, and 50 years old this year, believe it or not, is The Godfather. 50 years. It's disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> um, Don Corleone, played by Marlon Brando, of course, uh, was actually, there was a lot of kind of talk about which mafia mobster, you know, he, he reflected. And there's a couple of names, but they're all Italians. I'm sure you don't care which ones they are. But anyway, Carlo Gambino is one of them. But everybody seemed to settle on this guy, Frank Costello. And he was a master of a lot of things. One of them was keeping politicians in his pocket. But he was one of the most dangerous, really, gangsters yeah. there were. Yeah, he was, he was extremely dangerous. Um, but he, I suppose he was known as the Prime Minister of the Underworld because he had a, a very suave exterior. Um, he... he, he he particularly um, was one of the Italian immigrants that came to, to the U.S. at the turn of the 20th century. There was waves of immigrants, I suppose, from, from Ireland, from Italy, from Eastern Europe. And it all came into a melting pot in New York City, I suppose, at the turn of the 20th mm. century. Like, Frank Costello sounds like, you know, Irish. it sounds it Irish. Is, it, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. I was actually going to, did you say Costello? Yeah. I just say Costello, but it's actually is. No, he does have a, just a full-on Italian name, though he changed. Yes, he, so is, he is, sounds is, like he owns a DIY store. Yeah. Though. Costello <laughs> yeah, is yeah, off, or off, something like off that. the Long Mile Road or something yeah. like that. I feel like you can tell the tier of how what immigrants were respected at what level by an Italian lad changing his name to Irish. Yeah. He's yeah, like, I'll get a little bit more respectable if I'm have an Irish name. Yeah, yeah do you, you think so that's that, it? Or that less was curvy at, at, or something? Well, at the time, like, he, you know, he changed his name in, maybe in his 20s, and in part it was to fit in with Irish gangs. At that stage, you would have had... Um, the Italian Mafia was just another gang, really, in New York City. The, the Irish gangs had big control and certainly would have rivaled them. But over time, um, the Italian Mafia really took over and dominated organised crime right up until the 80s or the mm. 90s. Um, Frank Costello, when he was just a teenager, he, he'd been in and out of prison um, for sort of robbery, not, you know, relatively street gang sort of crimes. But he hooked up with a number of guys 
um, four guys in particular that would really become ultra famous in the world of, of organized crime and really change organized crime in a worldwide sense. Um, they would have been names like Charles Lucky Luciano, um, two Jewish gangsters who, at the time as well, the Jewish gangs really rivaled the Italian mafia, mm. um, uh, called uh, Bugsy Siegel and Meyer Lansky. And they were, in their early 20s, they were probably earning money, feared guys, doing extortion, but then they hit the boom time. Mm. And what caused the boom for these guys was one single thing, prohibition. I mean, it turned ordinary street drug thugs, really, into multimillionaires in the space of two years. I mean, these were guys in their, their early 20s who all of a sudden were, you know, really, really incredibly wealthy. I feel like I'm listening to myself about the cocaine dealers of today because it's exactly the same story, really. Not that I'm, you know, saying we should legalise cocaine, <laughs> but in fairness, <laughs> you prohibit something and you make people very rich. Um, yeah, Peter, what about the Godfather? There was three of them, and, uh, you know, uh, they're along. Would people nowadays watch them? If they were made now, they'd be a TV show. And you see, yeah. if you watch The Godfather now, you're like, oh, every TV show, like big, you know, uh, prestige TV show the last few years is just riffing on The Godfather. Like, it's like a big kind of sprawling cast with one main focal point and kind of, you know, there's a the family element and all that. I think it, it would, if it was made now, it'd be like 10 episodes a season kind of It series. opens, of course, on that wedding scene and the famous sort of Godfather waltz. And he is, uh, and actually, where is Enda? Because I can't see. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Enda did in the most amazing, and you'll see it on the poster somewhere, uh, poems oh, yeah. <laughs> as the Godfather. Like, it was unbelievable. Like, it really was. <laughs> I don't know whether... <laughs> you did a little bit of kind of, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis style. All we wanted you to do was a photograph, which it turned out actually was unreal. But he, um, you know, it starts in that wedding scene, and, of course, the Godfather, there's the kissing of the ring, and there's he's granting favours and to everyone who comes to them. But the second one is where you go back to the real story. It's the immigrant story. It's like how, how, how far you can go, in a, like America been the dream. So you can come over as a pauper, a child, like with nothing from uh, Sicily, to town of Corleone in Sicily, and you can end up being, you know, kind of having, having politicians in your pocket and all the rest of it. Yeah. Like it's kind of that kind of, like cr crime movie, American crime movies is always like that little warped version of the American dream. It's like you just come over, immigrant, work hard, you know, and uh, set aside some money and you can own a company or whatever. It's that, but more killing and shooting murders. <laughs> a little bit of the killing and the shooting. Have yeah. you been to Sicily? I haven't, I'd love to though. Yeah, have you been to Sicily? I haven't been to Sicily, no. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think, actually they, they said in The Godfather, after The Godfather came out, the mafia changed mm -hmm. to adopt the mannerisms of the people in the film, bizarrely. And they said the same about The Sopranos yeah. when it came out, that the, the real-life mobsters started copying yeah. Tony, like, yeah. you know? Mm. Um, but Frank Costello would have, like, like uh, Don Corleone, um, Frank Costello was one of the few, um, say the assassination attempt of Don Corleone when he shot coming out of his house, um, shot by an associate, and then he goes into retirement. That was really quite closely based on Frank Costello's life. Um, he got shot by one of his, his close friends, uh, um, one of the Genovese family, and he was one of the few gangsters to go fully into retirement. Um, he lived in the penthouse suite of the Waldorf Astoria mm. for the last 10 years of his I life. I mean, that is my dream. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Isn't that, I mean, it, how bad, like, how many people life, do you have like, to kill? Well, he, well, well. And you're not even killing them. No, you're, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Someone sends you, you an invoice. You just sort of drop it there, just kill your man, will you? And then yeah. off you go to and the Waldorf. He, and, he, and he spent his time growing roses and entering horticulture competitions. I mean, that is just weird. <laughs> <laughs> that bit is weird. Like, where yeah. did you find that fact? Uh, I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> it, uh, um, it, it, is, it is definitely true, Nicola. Yeah. Cause, um, cause, Everything that's said on crime work <laughs> is true. <laughs> but um, so he, he, he died of a heart attack, which was, you know, most of these guys, nearly every criminal that we talk about either gets shot or ends up in prison. Mm. But he was one of the few that got out of it. And he spent his latter years, um, like Don Corleone, just sort of mediating disputes. Mm. Yeah. But even, even after he died, uh, he wasn't 
totally free because they built a big tacky mausoleum to him to bury him and somebody bombed it because he decided <laughs> yeah. against it. Excited against but him isn't it amazing dispute. like he operated as a mediator until he died exactly what the, the type of of gangland maybe or the underworld that Jerry Hutch it was reminiscing on as he traveled yeah. in that car yeah. up to Belfast and he was thinking where are the mediators they're all yeah. gone why are we yeah. shooting one another where are the good decent criminals that yeah. are gonna, they're going to settle disputes and all it, that's, that's a job opening isn't it <laughs> <Mediators> <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. if the cocaine business yeah. doesn't work out here <laughs> Right, well, look, out of those early mob families came a young rising star who po probably remains one of the most famous mafiosas of all time. Um, despite the passage of time, if you ask people, you know, who's the most famous criminal, so many will still say Al Capone. Al Capone um, is my sort of idea of what the, the real life nowadays Mr. Flashy is like. I mean, he was mega by the age of 26. He was the boss of the Chicago mobs. He was a multi, multi-millionaire. And by 32, he was all over. Yeah. yeah. Did you know that? Oh, like, it's That's so bizarre how much we still talk about there? it. I know. <laughs> I mean, seriously, all yeah. those people, all those black I'm and white I'm 33, pictures. and I hopefully... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, that was in his heyday, apparently. Yeah. But, but everyone looks old in old pictures. Do you notice that? They do. Yes. You Hard living. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. It's because it's in black and white. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's the style and everything, but... No, but, but it's, it, it's, it is kind of like when you hear, like, bands that, like, <laughs> like we're not... You're like, why are we still up with them? They were only around for a couple of years. It's the same with him. It's like he yeah. was only actually knocking around for a bit, but he made an impact. Yeah, he certainly did. And, so, and like, like the flashy kind of guys, although they didn't have Instagram back in the 1930s, I'm pretty sure, but, but he constantly posed for, yeah. for pictures, did magazine interviews. Mm. Did you see so, The Untouchables, which is a totally yeah. historically wrong film, but the stuff yeah. of him has been a total press whore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a press whore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Al Capone, a press whore. Actually, and do you know They'll what? They'll sue you now, the Capones. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to put a retraction Come out in. of the grave. I have my lawyers here, I see. <laughs> um, but I, I lived in Chicago for a year, and it is like, when you go around like Bono, if pubs claim on Bono, it's like everywhere, it's like, Al used to drink here. Really? You know, yeah, yeah. Still? It is, it's, uh, What's it's, wrong with it's, people? Uh, I mean, it is a bit cool. You do want to. But you know, he had loads of nicknames, Scarface, Big Al, public enemy number one, they called him. And I did kind of think to myself, back then, the Sunday world didn't even exist, so... No. We didn't do it. We didn't make up the nicknames. <laughs> no. It was way before, <laughs> wasn't it? No, we cannot be blamed for that one. Absolutely for sure, not. No. no, but crime, crime has always been glamorous, and that, that is the reason they're making prim, fil, great films about gangsters and not. And great he podcasts. Was a, he not was a womanizer as well. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Where's he gone? He was a womanizer, and uh, he certainly doesn't, I have to say, do it for me, Al Capone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> give you a tiny bit of background on him while we're talking about him because we'll move on but born in Brooklyn New York in 1899 grew up very poor father was a barber uh, but he they were kind of the American dream like he was to you know go out there and get rich he dropped out of school got involved in street gangs you know started off small sounds like everybody from nowadays but um, yeah he was kind of like there at the time when prohibition came in and he was uh, you know, he was a, a big boss there. But, interestingly, do you know how, do you know how he died? Okay. Do you know how he died? Do you know how he died? You can say it. Syphilis. Neurosyphilis. Yeah. yeah. Coincidentally timed Syphilis with him coming out of work? Alcatraz prison and then he had all of a sudden... Did he not have it syphilis. before he went in? Or maybe he did. So but neurosyphilis is... Brain. It's I know, but yeah, it's basically where the the, the, the clap on your brain, <laughs> yeah. basically. Yeah. It basically it's syphilis. It it eats away at your brain mm. unless treated, and it was quite a, a common thing amongst a certain type of gentleman. Uh, yeah. Up until the middle of the twentieth century, us, no, a certain type of gentleman. <laughs> it sounded gross, anyway. Yeah. But he went around all these prisons. They caught him obviously for tax, and there was Elliot Ness, which would be sort of leaned on when you talk about the Criminal Assets Bureau and the whole idea mm. of going after the money. 
uh, that they got him for. They got him for 10 years. They made a show of him because he had been so, you know, he'd been buying all these politicians and he was so untouchable. And at one point, the mayor of Chicago, who was in his pocket, started to criticise the fact that certain beers were being allowed into the city and because speakeasies, which this place is a bit like a speakeasy, this was the kind of place we'd be drinking in if, uh, you know, prohibition was around. Uh, but he, your man, the mayor, was making this speech about it and he actually went up behind him and physically kicked him down the steps and a policeman turned his back and everyone, that's how powerful he was. But um, yeah, ended up in Alcatraz with syphilis of the brain. <laughs> And, so let uh, that be a lesson to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too late. Died in a fog of dementia, apparently. So that's a nice way, you know, fog of dementia, isn't it? Sort of. Anyway, so look, while Capone's life was short and brutal, another famous mobster that inspired the movies would live well into his old age. But his end is a lesson in how... Few of them get to die peacefully after a life of crime. And of course, we're talking about James Whitey Bulger, played, Peter, by Jack Nicholson in The Departed. Mm -hmm. I called Frank Costa, obviously a, a restaurant to that. They call him Frank Costa. Because I think Whitey Bulger was still alive when they made The Departed. Mm. But um, yeah, I didn't... Because The Departed I've seen a few times, and they really lean into the, the idea that there's like a, almost like a gay undercurrent to him and all that. And then I didn't realise to looking at actually apparently Whitey Bulger was bisexual. Did as well. they? I didn't even notice that in the film. Yeah, I was always flat out in the old articles there. I'm really like, bad at those. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh, I didn't notice that in the film. I mean, like I didn't. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. no, it's it's that, kind of that Jack Nicholson was gay in it. Not hi, not him. It's Matt Damon's character. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Who's this little like the yeah. lad? He's groomed from a young age. He's tucked under his wing, and then there's this whole thing about he's always making these really like homophobic slurs, and yeah. he can't get it up with the wife, and then he's always, he's like. Talking about how he's having loads, but then he's with the lads. He's all, so there's this, this like weird, like what's like, is it the stress of being a, a rat in the police force, or is it something yeah. a bit more of that? Uh, and then I was like, I was one. I always had that in my head from watching the film. Then today I was looking, I was like, I was wondering, is that no reference to that? Because apparently Whitey Bulger was hanging out. Uh, yeah. There's some gay district in Boston. I have interesting like, things to tell you about his women, but anyway. Um, but he was a proud, a Do you proud know that first scene, though, Peter? Describe that because I mean that I think sums up what Whitey Bulger, all the and obviously his character Frank yeah. Costello in the in the Departed. What happens in that first scene in the shop there? Yeah, yeah where it's like he he sees the he comes into the shop like he owns the place wherever he's like hitting on this child of a young one behind the counter who's the daughter of the shop owner. It's all very sleep. And then the character Matt Damon plays Billy Coskin. I think he's at the counter. And he starts buying him comics and buying him. He's like, his, his father is absent. The mother, you know, they're mm -hmm. having trouble at home. And he's buying him loaves of bread and milk and comics for himself. And it's that thing of like basically grooming, grooming young folks, yeah, basically grooming. like getting them under the wing and then like bringing them along through, through years. And then when he has them in, infiltrate the police force, then it's like you've an asset there who's like completely beholden to you from day one, basically. But I mean, it's amazing parallels that Whitey Bulger, of course, he became the most wanted man in, in the world, really, mm -hmm. at mm. one stage, because, um, and the, the amazing fact is that, you know, he tried to smuggle weapons into Ireland mm. for the IRA. I mean, he was, he was considered himself Irish. It was from, as you see in the film, that Southie accent yeah. and all of that. Um, and, you know, we have people sitting in, just retired from sitting in the doll today, who, who were set to oh, receive right. a ship yeah. in the weapons from, from Whitey Bulger. Mm. It's quite incredible. And, he, you know, he went, obviously, Nicola was saying, like, he, 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 he became wanted by the, by the police. The police hunted him down, set to charge him with murder, and he, he disappeared, which is, mm. you know... And we... You, Nicola will know as well. We used to get the odd email every now and again, Whitey Bulger's yeah. down. I think yeah. he's down in, in Dunleary yeah. or, or wherever. Truth, and honest to God, he was know? like Larry Murphy. He showed up everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he only died in 2012. Like, That's a good so. sitcom idea to do yeah. it out hide No, no, I mean, no. Every, every week, every week since Larry Murphy has been released... If you get someone. an email, he's living down the road from me. It'll yeah. just be some he's the most well-travelled man. Yeah, it's just some guy with red hair. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, and every summer they, they come in that he's, he's in, a, you know, like a car, like not a caravan, a mobile home site in Wexford, and he's moved into it. It's yeah. just bizarre that anybody would think Larry Murphy's in there. But just a little bit of background on Whitey Bulger. Obviously, he's a South 
Boston Irish background. He went into the army and got in trouble um, by, yeah, interestingly, he went to prison in Alcatraz when he was in his sort of early 30s. And Alcatraz was the worst place you could possibly go, and everybody wanted to get out of it. So there was this kind of CIA-sponsored program to test LSD on people. And he decided he'd go for it to see if he could get out early, because if they did the program, they'd get out early. Now, he claimed, and others knew him, claimed that for the rest of his life he had nightmares, hallucinations, insomnia. Um, others would say he was a sociopath, and he was <laughs> like that before. But, you know, we'll take a little bit of that. Um, he was, first and foremost, an FBI informant and very controversially was giving and getting information while he was at the top end of his game because, you know, informants usually shouldn't really be the bosses of murderous gangs. When um, Whitey, when the, the, the local police force in Boston decided to go for him, his FBI agent tipped him off. He went on the run with a woman. Now, wait till you hear I this. said bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> Wait till you hear this, right? He went on the run with this woman, okay? With one woman. And she realised that she missed her family and wanted to go back. So his mate had another woman and they swapped. And he sent the one who wanted to go back back and the mate sent him his woman, who was Cathy Craig, who uh, was arrested with him when he was eventually caught in 2011 living in Santa Monica. Um, now, when Whitey went to jail, because he was found guilty of 11 of 19 murders, a lot of the murders, if you actually look at them, are because people are threatening to out him as an informant, or they know he's an informant, or whatever, so he's motive for a lot of his murders. Uh, one of the murders, one of the 19, was a woman called Deborah Davis, who he strangled, which would be very unusual. Um, so anyway, he went to jail, he was moved around the prison system a lot. He was obviously in a lot of danger in jail because he was a rat, an informant. And he eventually landed in um, West Virginia, where he was put into the main prison population. Most of his time in prison, he would have been kept in isolation or whatever. And he's 89 years of age at this stage, and he's in a wheelchair. And one day, this hitman from Boston, this was in 2012, this is not ancient history, um, wheeled him into a corner where there was no CCTV cameras on him, and they beat him to death and gouged his eyeballs out. Yeah. That's how he died at 89. After getting away with it for many, many years, Jeez. he looked like... Yeah. And, you know, it, it was always said about Whitey, he's the one that got You're away. You're looking at me as if that's a story in the Sunday world <laughs> and you don't believe it. That's the truth. Yeah. You can Google it. <laughs> I believe everything I read. <laughs> yeah. As you should. So that was poor Whitey. Yeah. That's a sad island. Yeah, it was a... And let that be a lesson <laughs> to you. <laughs> well, look, while Whitey fiercely defended accusations of being a snitch and even killed to keep his secret, there was another informant who did exactly the opposite and who became the most famous rat of all. And, of course, we're going to talk about Henry Hill. Oh, yeah. Which is Played there, there, there by is Ray Liotta in Goodfellas. Yeah, absolutely unforgettable film, mm -hmm. really, Goodfellas. Yeah. And there, there's the real Henry Hill. Um, he was, his father was born in Ireland, actually, and emigrated to the US when he was 12, and he married a Sicilian woman. And that meant Henry Hill could never become a made man in the Mafia because he was half Irish. But he, he had an introduction into the Mafia as a teenager as well, as you see in the it's film. It's kind of racist, though, isn't it? Well, it is racist. PC got mad, huh? Yeah. yeah. They're, not, they're not necessarily nice guys, the old no. Mafia, you know? Um, no Irish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he, he was straight away into the... Which really were the staple diet of the Mafia at the time. He was, he was done... He was first went to jail for extortion. For, uh, he set fire to a rival, uh, a rival shop. Um, he was also involved in collecting, uh, you know, gambling debts and all of that. And he eventually went to uh, the military. But when he came back, he hit the big time. And it's with two, with two mafia associates as well, famously played by Robert De Niro and, and Danny DeVito. As always. Absolutely. Yeah, ab absolutely. Scorsese's pals. They were, their real life names were Tommy DeSimone and James Jimmy DeGent Burke. Absolutely, uh, these guys. I suppose Henry Hill be hit the big time with two heists. One of them, he literally got a suitcase, walked into the airport, 
got a key off of an, in, an insider, opened the door, went in and filled up a suitcase with half a million, walked out, nobody held up, nobody noticed, it went for four or five days, and then he became a big-time mafia guy. And then, of course, the really famous one was the 1978, um, the Lufthansa heist, in, 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 also in, uh, in JFK Airport, where they got the equivalent of 24 million in modern-day money. So, I mean, I think Henry Hill was, was, he was, he hit the big time then. You see in the film as well that I think Goodfellas is really, really quite close to real, mm -hmm. to real life. Some of the others are, the films really vary from it. But you see, he moved into what happened to the mafia as well. He went up, ended up in the drugs business. And um, that caused a lot of disquiet within the mafia. He had a, he had a boss called Paul Vario who, who didn't approve of that and they decided to, to whack uh, Henry Hill. Um, and as a result, the FBI played him a tape where mm -hmm. he was saying, we might have to get rid of him, basically. Yeah. Mm. And he decided to go and became an informer. And that effectively brought down one of the families mm. of the Mafia. 50 people ended up in prison. And uh, Henry Hill, I think, from my, from my own perspective, it created the greatest mob film of all time, Goodfellas. What about Ray Liotta? Oh, all right, Lee, he's unreal. He's yeah. fantastic. It's a next level performance, especially as it goes along, because he plays, he plays him from like early 20s to whatever age he is by the end, but it changes. He's like such a cocky, swaggering guy. Mm. And then as it goes along, he's just coked up, paranoid, yeah. sweating. It is insane. It's an insanely good performance. And, it's and, like, and I think that's kind of like what did happen to the Mafia. Yeah. Like they went from a controlled good fellas to yeah. being coked up paranoid yeah. and, and on their way out. Um, he went into witness protection, of course, just like Jonathan Dowdall, and, uh, but he... Uh, in it, what, yeah. was it true? It's true. They both, only just they, the both have, they both have good hair huh? as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, <laughs> the witness protection that he went into was the start of it and that's really it was actually back then and to dismantle the mafia that the witness protection was program was actually set up it made its way over here in 96 with the murder of veronica Guerin, and um you know we have had quite a few on it uh, as well the point of it is to keep them alive so as they can mm -hmm. give evidence but i mean you know this guy has been going on the Howard Stern show this in his is later it, life. Yeah. What the f I mean... I don't yeah. understand it. I've watched him on Howard, like, locked out of his mind on, like, video. It's not even right. Like, you can see video footage of him on Howard. And you're like, you're meant to be in hiding. There's yeah. lads yeah. who want to kill you. And you're just... But it's like he just obviously needed the money. Yeah. And he was an alcoholic. Well, he got, he got, of course, kicked off the witness protection program. Because of his selling, behavior. Uh, for selling cocaine. Mm -hmm. so, and, and you know. <laughs> That's the last thing yeah. you should have done, Henry. Yeah. Well, yeah. But you sort of think people in the witness protection program should be super good, like, don't you? And they just aren't really, no. anyway. But I mean, it's been it's it's a it's a it's a mixed blessing, isn't it? The wit the, the evidence from wit witnesses who are in, in the program, mm. particularly in Ireland, it's been sometimes accepted, and sometimes the courts have have looked on it as as being compromised. Now, if you're in Ireland, you go yeah. to witness protection. Yeah. You can't be in Ireland, surely. No, 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 yeah, no, they well, would. They could put you anywhere. Yeah. They could put you anywhere. You're supposed to be, you're moved after you give your evidence and like we would partner up with loads of different countries, Canada, lots of English speaking territories mm -hmm. would take ours and we'd take theirs. Okay. So we take theirs as well. So it could be anybody sitting beside you on the bus. Well, if you got the bus. bus. <laughs> <laughs> if you got the bus. But, uh, no, um, no, but I mean, Jonathan Dowdle may, may be able to survive in another country. He was a politician, yeah. a businessman, but uh, some of the people... I wonder, I don't know how you would... How would you hide nowadays? Like, I mean, if you didn't have a background on social media or pictures of you looking ridiculous 10 yeah. or 20 years ago, is that not a massive red flag? Mm. No. If something yeah. doesn't exist, like... Yeah, don't Google me, because nothing will come up. Yeah. But, Why is that? But a lot of the guys who do go on witness protection, they just can't really cope with living mm. in Australia or... or yeah. And they eventually come back. They go mm -hmm. off it and take the risk of their lives mm. because it's very hard for people to give up everything that they have known Mm. And you, you, you know, well, we'll see what happens with the, yeah. with the Regency trial. <laughs> Not to get into it too much. We'll see. I get into it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
So we've the gangsters turning on one another when things go wrong, but what about law enforcement and, you know, how do they infiltrate the mobs? Because this is also a really important arm of policing. Um, to go deep undercover is an incredibly difficult thing and nobody was more successful than one man who gave up six years of his life undercover in the Mafia. His name was Joe Pistoni, but the movie Donny Brasco starring Johnny Depp was based on him, according to Joe Pistoni, who's now Mr. Undercover, living in fear of his life, a podcast star, <laughs> right? Now, he's a bit older now, but he said that Donny Brasco was based kind of 85% on his right. memoirs. So tell me a little bit about that movie. Well, yeah, it's a kind of the... It's a great movie for, like, because the, the kind of his in is like befriending this character, I can't remember his name, Playboy Al Pacino, but it's like... Lefty. 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 Yeah. The hitman. Yes, and it's like they present him as this kind of sad, sack, pathetic lad who never quite made it, because if you are going to infiltrate the mafia, like, the lads at the top don't want, want to know you, it's the lads who want to seem like they're important. Yeah. And, and that's felt very true to life, I think. It's like, it's the lads who kind of have a bit of a wasted life and they want to feel important and then if you can kind of gain their trust, they'll bring you in rather yeah. than you going straight to the sunny black, one of those bigger kind of honchos. But it was a very important thing in, in, in bringing the Mafia to really to, to, to where they are now, which is really a de defeated force because his evidence, Donny Brasco, I mean, he was in there for five years with the, 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 the family um, he, under Paul Castellano and that that evidence allowed them to dismantle what was known as the commission, yeah. which was really like the a controlling the board, body, like the board of yeah. management of the mafia. Yeah. Amazing to think of it. And they sat down the bosses every few years. And if they want, if somebody wanted to be killed, they'd have to agree to it, and they'd hire a hitman yeah. to kill him. And he, that was really the last gasp of the mafia as 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 the all-powerful uh, force mm. in, in, in U.S. crime. But, like, their structure was to be admired, you yeah. have to say, like, that they actually <laughs> yeah. just, you know, they had all these rules. Like, if you were a made man, you're not allowed to beat up a make, made man at all. You're not allowed to hit him. Yeah. So if he hits you, you have to hit someone else who mm. isn't a made man just to... You know, oh, it's it's strange. genius. If you read into it, it's like, it is like the likes of Luciano and they were, like, kind of genius. It's taken, a, taken the idea of like American 20th century capitalism where you're like, you have the mom and pop stores which were just like old Sicilian men who ran their little pockets and they sometimes had wards. And then these young lads just came in and they wiped them all out, came together as one big massive shareholders basically mm. of this industry. Yeah. And they got away with so many murders because if you wanted somebody killed in New York, you asked the Cincinnati oh, yeah. mob to do it. And they, out they of never, yeah, they just bring them in yeah. out of towners. They've no motive, they've no history in the town, mm. nobody's gonna recognize them. And it was hundreds and hundreds of murders mm. that, that mm. remain unsolved to this day. Literally, Murder Incorporated was this yeah. Yeah. thing. Yeah, like, that's, like literally. yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. It was dubbed. So it was an, it, it, like, but the, the, the American Mafia, uh, they eventually, and this is what happens really with all criminal gangs, and we've seen it with the Kinnahan cartel in Ireland as well, they eventually became too powerful mm. and they attracted the attention of the state, the full attention of the state. And no matter how powerful a criminal gang gets, the state always wins if it, if it focuses its resources eventually on it. And it took them maybe 20 years, but they were eventually broken. And we're seeing a bit of it, we're seeing it with the Kinahan cartel as well. It became so powerful and were allowed to get really powerful in Ireland. But eventually, no matter how powerful they get, the state is stronger. But you know, again, you'd wonder if you would ever be able to put an individual now that deep undercover into a criminal gang. You know, a, yeah. you know, police yeah. officer, like we had the mockies, of course, in Ireland who were <laughs> who were buying lumps of hash on on the common street. And stuff. Yeah. <laughs> We've been doing that what? for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like you know, nowadays, do, can you like possibly Again, just it's emerge? Social media. Isn't it's like, it? it's like, like I'll just look you up. Just yeah, look you yeah. up. Yeah, I, I think it is probably impossible because Donny Brasco, of course, pitches up in a bar and says he's a jewel, jewel thief. thief. Yeah, and, and that's what the real life Joe Pistone did as well. And he was weeks just sitting there eating in the bar and hoping that somebody would talk to him. And eventually he kind of befriended this barman and 
uh, this barman, he t offered to sell him some jewels and this barman basically introduced him to the rest of them and then he kind of got into it. But um, I just don't know how that would happen. No, no I mean, it, it, things, things have changed. And of course, when Donny Brasco or when Joe Pistoni did it, it was unheard of, you know, it yeah. hadn't been done before. So they wouldn't have been as paranoid as no, they would now no. as well, yeah. So look, of course, the business of crime is all centred on the money. Um, you know, that's what keeps the wheels turning. Uh, when you see the kind of money nowadays, it's like, where do the zeros end? Um, I can hardly pronounce it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, back in the day when the mafias were emerging, they were making loads and loads and loads of money and they had to launder it some way. So what they did was, they say, they built Vegas. And it was the mob, really, that were there laundering their money in Las Vegas. That's how it emerged from the desert. Has anyone been to Vegas? Has anyone not? <laughs> Love it. One of my favorite places on the planet. <laughs> Honestly, it is. Oh yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I love the whole idea that you can stumble down to the reception of a hotel at like six in the morning, jet lagged, and people are on the slots and, ga you know, people going past with trays of drinks and everything is mental. She's a woman of culture. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Sicily and you two haven't. <laughs> so. That brings us to Frank Lefty Rosenthal and the movie Casino, which I think is your favourite. It is, yeah. I love it. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of the lightly fiction. It's Martin Scorsese again about... Uh, it's not about the founding of Vegas, but it's, it's mainly set in, like, the 70s, 60s, where it's this character in the film. He's Sam Rothstein, played by Robert De Niro, but in, um, in real life, he's this guy, Frank Lefty Rosenthal. He was this... I don't know what exactly what you call his role is. He was basically, he was this genius gambler, mm. uh, Jewish fella. And he was in with the mob and they handpicked him to kind of run. In real life, it was the Stardust Casino, but in the film, it's the Tangiers because they couldn't, for whatever legal reason, they couldn't say Stardust. But he, um, yeah, he ended up out there running the show. And the film is basically, the, the concept of the film is like having a good thing and messing it up. So right. like his friend... Uh, Nicky comes out to play by Joe Pesci again, comes out to stay with him uh, and kind of start running the kind of more ground level criminal operations. And it's that kind of thing of like, if you just keep your head down, mm. we'll be grand. And then he just refuses to do it and just causes carnage because if you just tell him something, he'll want to do the opposite because that's these kind of, if you're a criminal used to just, you know, bending yeah. the law to your will, that's what's going to happen. And uh, it's just about how you, the mafia had this. Money maker, literally legal mm. gambling, this city that they ran, and then all they need to do is not attract attention, and then because they, they're their nature, they attract attention, and then you've got the gambling commission. You yeah, if they don't shoot one another and stuff, it would help. And exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they say that everywhere, you know? I know, it's a shame. That's why they're getting on okay in Dubai, because they're not shooting. They're yeah. actually not shooting one another. That's the truth. Yeah. They're not shooting one another in Dubai, and that's why mm. they're able to, one of the reasons why they're able to say their deep <laughs> pockets are another. Um, <laughs> But the, obviously the love affair in this movie yeah. is a big part and of it as well. And she's brilliant in it, Sharon, Sharon Stone. Stone. I mean, yeah. She's absolutely fantastic, you know? Ginger. Yeah, it's that, like, again, it's, it's the character. It, again, it's like, you have a good thing, don't mess it up, but it's in your nature. She's like this, she's, again, a gambler, a good time girl, and she's had this horrific, grim life, so it's like dictionary definition of a survivor. And then she, Ace Rothstein, has this obsession with her. He's the big man in Vegas running this casino. He brings her in, they have, enough, they, they have this relationship, they get married, but she just can't help. She's always squirreling away money. She doesn't have to do it, you know, she, what's his is, is hers, but she's always squirreling away money, like embezzling money, you know, going back to her old pimp, uh, just because it's that like, kind of ground down survivor nature of her. Yeah. And, uh, and again, that's part of the reason, of, within the f context of the film, that's the downfall of everything is like tied into that. And, and his thing so of like... So a woman is to blame as opposed to all the <laughs> criminality and the gambling. A woman and, and a mad lad. No, no. <laughs> uh, and, and, and De Niro's... H. Uh, Rothstein, it's that thing. Again, it's like, he's, it's that thing of... Because he's this controlling, like, bizarrely controlling thing. It's like, because this expert gambler, he wants... He can see all the angles. He, can, he just kn knows everything down. He's a, a perfectionist, basically. And the one thing he can't control, his mate and his wife. Yeah. And, 
the attraction. If he could just cut cut them mm. loose, it, it'd be fine. But he just needs needs to know he can control them, and that makes them buck against him. It's yeah, it's not. He's so brilliant, though, Joe Pesci, isn't he? Like, oh, it's, yeah. it's great to see a, 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 a vertically challenged man can be tough and <laughs> fierce <laughs> with a squeaky voice. Yeah. 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 There's hope for us all, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there is, ah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so the real life Jerry, just to bring it down a notch again, uh, <laughs> died age 46 in a, well, they called it a mental asylum in those days, but yeah, she actually ended up like, I think she just lived life on the edge and she yeah. found it all exciting and dangerous, which is most of the women. Mm. Do you know what? Like, in most of the movies, the women are portrayed, well, the women are arm candy, aren't they? Yeah. Like, all these gangster movies are just so... It's a bit like the, the Sean Quinn documentary, yeah. like, so male, and there's yeah. no women there Speaking at all. Speaking of gangsters. But it is... <laughs> Except, uh, I'm not sure about the eye candy and no. that. Yeah. Look, e equal opportunities. Hopefully someday women will be murdering <laughs> as well. <laughs> I'll fight for the rights of women yeah. of the underworld. Um, but yeah, they seem to have this sort of like, you know, there's an attraction there for the bad boy and the, there's a whiff of sulfur and yeah. there's glamour. And is just the best someone just go that. in there. Sorry, I thought someone just fell. Um, no, but it is a deeply misogynistic culture like gangland culture in Ireland and in, in other very places. Very much and so. A lot, of, a lot of domestic violence and all that stuff. So, you know. So then just the last on our list of who we're going to talk about is a, a guy called John List. And he was the inspiration for Kevin Spacey's character in The Usual Suspects. So while The Usual Suspects obviously is a fictional movie, as opposed to, you know, something near real life, this guy, John List, weirdo, murdered his whole family and then went off to kind of just like, actually, I think sat down for lunch having done it, cleaned up, and then took off and just started life again somewhere else in another part of the world. Yeah, I think, jo I think John, oh, Lee, yeah. like, it's, it's certainly not a direct, like, like Goodfellas, a, a true-to-life, the usual suspects, but I think it's kind of, you know, it was a, the idea that a man could do this unbelievably horrific thing. I mean, he killed his, 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 his wife, her mother, his three kids, and, you know then just go on and live a normal life because he just disappeared, ended up in Virginia and just became an accountant and just settled down. And that's a kind of a concept of, of maybe a Mr. Nobody mm -hmm. as we have in Ireland, you know, in reference to the Kinahan cartel where these guys can be shadowy figures, do these terrible things, but then on the other hand, hand live it absolutely normal life to all intents and purposes. Or else they show up in the middle of a gang like Sammy Tannenbar. Yeah. You know, this guy was sort of showed up in the middle of this kind of group, this sort of flashy gang a couple of years ago, and he was this Iranian, and he had these teardrops on his face, and we were told that he was Daniel Kinahan's personal hitman who'd been, who'd been sent over to finish the feud. And he was a very sinister-looking character, I have to say, very, very sinister, but he had embedded himself in this gang and he ended up getting shot dead, actually, at a wake he attended because he was blamed on a murder. But it turned out he had this completely... Like, Fantastic. He was yeah. sort of a Walter Mitty type. Spoofer. Of a, yeah, spoofer. a spoofer. <laughs> he spoofed his way to death, literally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> literally. He wasn't, like, he was supposed to have been, like, you know... But the teardrops are meant to be each one for each person each he killed. Each person he killed, but it didn't seem... No, 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 this was, like, it was unbelievable. But he was in the middle of this gang, and everyone believed this story about him, but it turned out that he was just sort of a regular punter. Minor like. fraudster, I think. Yeah, sort yeah. of fraudster. One of the, yeah. in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, when Capone killed those seven uh, members of the Irish gang, the Northside gang, one, there were six of them were gangsters. One of them was his dentist who got his kicks <laughs> hanging around yeah. with gangsters. And Weird. he just happened to be hanging out in the garage that day. When he got and killed. And they're like, well, you're in as well. Yeah, and he got killed. He was sickened. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> unbelievable. You would be, really. You really would be. Does I let us in. in. <laughs> <laughs> Rule a tree, I won't do it again. So look, they're just some of the iconic characters that were brought to life on the big screen and we all have our favourites and we're going to just do uh, a couple of little uh, bits. Cloda has been working hard collecting the uh, <laughs> votes from everybody. And
and we've loads, but we will maybe publish them, Claude, and I'll just read out the, the three. And obviously, Kiva has been working really hard on all this <laughs> fabulous night. And uh, Dingle Whiskey, thank you very much. I'm actually going to have this now. <laughs> very nice. I think we'll all it agree that nice. we had a lovely spread here tonight. And uh, <laughs> the star of the night has to be Emma, and I hope she's still here. <laughs> Can see nothing. Emma and Peter have a couple of shows coming up. I've already booked to go and see Emma next year in the Pavilion Theatre in Dunleary, but she has shows on all over the country. Peter, you're having Shane and Peter's Christmas party on Saturday night in Liberty Hall. Um, it's a comedy night and Emma's, Emma's on, on that. the bill, yeah. Emma's on the bill. That sounds really good. I'm actually going to go to that. Um, and tell me, you've other shows coming up as well? Um, well, you haven't announced them yet, haven't but we'll announce them, them now. Uh, <laughs> keep, keep an eye, it'll be Christmas, good Christmas present to get for your fella, probably. Uh, April the 28th will be in Liberty April 28th, Hall. April 28th, Liberty Hall. Great lad, is going to be the name of the show. It's no, it's no good to you now, but it will be. And there's nothing like a night, in fairness, of comedy, and you can sit back, and for me, anyway, it's an escapism. Emma Doran says crime is an escapism for her, <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> I don't know which one of us is odder. <laughs> um, so, right, of our poll, favourite character. Um, sorry, before I trip over my wires here, where are we? We're like on IVs. Yeah, we have a lot of kind of... <laughs> wouldn't have wanted too much whiskey. Um, the favourite character, going backwards, number three was Henry Hill from Goodfellas. Um, <laughs> Number two was Tommy DeVito, also from Goodfellas. And number one, do I need to even? Do I? Say hello. Oh, you're drunk. <laughs> uh, Tony Montana, Scarface. Yeah. Such a great character, like. Um, we're going to just do the favourite gangster film. Number three, I'm surprised. Scarface and the Godfather and joined third. Ah. Yeah. Cloda. What the hell went on there? I can't count. I can't. You can't count either. There's two of us. Thank God there's Ian who can. Um, second place, Pulp Fiction. Yeah, love this movie. And in first place, the favourite gangster film of our listeners is Goodfellas. Hey. 33%, yeah. And finally, before we all go and get a much needed drink, or I at least finish that one <laughs> uh, for the moment. She has intent. Uh, best soundtrack. Number three, The Godfather. You know, you have to be in the mood, don't you, for that yeah. waltz singing and everything. Uh, number two is Goodfellas. Yeah. And I think we'll play out on number one. Do I need to say it? I love you, honey bunny. Everybody be cool, this is a robbery! Yeah. 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 Yeah.